So um, before I talk a little bit about the innovative calendar, I just wanted to mention that I'm going to give you some brief high-level information about the innovative calendar. Tonight's pur purpose is really to give you enough information to move forward to uh, for us to present a proposal to the Maryland State Board of Education uh, on the waiver application that we must complete. And then we will be continuing to work on the programmatic aspects. I want to say hello to um, Ms. Folk. She's in the audience. She's one of the principals in the Rex Senate school year. And Mr. Jean-Philippe is watching. Hello. And we have staff from both schools who are watching. So I'm giving them a shout out to say hello. Um, but just um, a little bit of background um, in terms of the why and the vision, we really wanted to make sure that um, Dr. Smith was looking at his strategic prior priorities. Um, how do we implement extended school opportunities? We have after-school programs that we do. We have our normal ELO sale, extended learning opportunities in the summer. But how do we look at doing something differently to provide more enrichment and learning opportunities for students, as well as to prevent summer lo learning loss? And so um, when Dr. Navarro came in and talked with us about what this could look like, a central office team was convened to begin to think about um, what this could, could be like in MCPS. Um, we looked at a variety of research. We looked at um, year-round school in other states um, and other school districts to kind of get a sense of, of what could become of this. Um, uh, Dr. Navarro, as well as Mr. Chris Lloyd, who's the president of the Montgomery County Education Association, um, facilitated a group along with myself as we, get, we began to brainstorm what the extended school year, the innovative calendar, could look like. Um, and so that started way back in about August, September of 2017. Um, as you can see listed, there are a variety of uh, offices that are represented in ongoing discussions as well as initial discussions around the innovative school calendar. Um, again, we didn't want this to be something that was top down where central office was saying, this is what the extended school year needs to look like and this is what it's going to be, but rather have it grow organically. So as we got together, we began to brainstorm and think about um, before going out to schools and talking with communities, we need to have our, our house in order, so to speak, so that we're all on the same page. So we had a lot of uh, discussions early on around September and October before going out to really think about identifying specific schools. As we continued the conversations around the schools, we um, considered the overall performance data across all of our, we had 25 Title I schools at the time, so we looked at performance data in collaboration with the Office of School Support and Improvement. We looked at the tenure of principals in the school, the stability of Title I status, because um, Title I funds will also be used to support this initiative as well, and so we want to make sure that a school remains um, a Title I school. We also looked at data to see across our Title I schools enrollment in our existing summer programs where we had high enrollment and also the community engagement of both of the, all of the communities across our Title I schools as well. Um, so there were a variety of discussions. Dr. Navarro and Mr. Lloyd went out to meet with various staff at schools. Um, met with uh, the principal leaders, we're meeting with uh, SEIU staff as well as um, McCap staff to talk about the vision. And we narrowed it down to two schools, Arcola Elementary School and Roscoe Nix Elementary School. And those are the schools, again, we collaborated with OSSI in, in deciding those schools. So um, as we were gearing up to begin to think about uh, more deeply what this would look like, we also had to make sure we investigated what the process was for um, trying to get a waiver for implementation of, it would be July 8th of 2019. So we continued to do some fact finding. We um, also held meetings at both of the schools. Uh, PTA meetings as well as community meetings. Our principals continue to engage the community during parent coffees that they had, staff meetings, um, parent newsletters, um, registration packets that they developed during kindergarten orientation, as well as you walk in the building. Because communication, as we just talked about, is very, very important. And so as we learn from implementing other programs, we just want to make sure that the communication is continuing across families, across the staff, as well as across the students, as well and the, the greater communities. The principals had already reached out to the daycare providers at both of the schools as well to make sure they were aware so that that could continue for families as well. 
Um, we also provided updates to our central office partners as well so that they knew things were still rolling. We are moving forward. Um, and then using uh, staff from both schools that were um, teacher leaders or just classroom teachers as well as support staff, whether it's in the secretaries or building service, um, as well as parent representation, myself and my team, uh, brought together what we're calling an implementation team. And our major focus has been really on figuring out what the calendar could look like and looking at some options. We've talked briefly about the programmatic pieces, but we know that we have to get the calendar um, in the extended year, um, the number of days, the 30 extra days approved first. Um, so it's an energized, exciting, and committed group of staff across both of the schools. Um, and you would really find that they are very student-centered, as well as thinking about what they would need for themselves as staff, but they have come up with some very student-centered um, ideas to ensure that there's a high level of engagement, as well as fulfilling the mission of uh, making sure that there isn't a lack of learning loss. Um, there are a few similarities and differences between the, uh, the, the traditional school calendar at MCPS and the innovative school calendar. Um, one of the major differences is that the general calendar has 180 instructional days, whereas the innovative calendar would extend the year by 30 days, so the instructional year would be 210 days. Um, because, again, we are asking to start before the Labor Day, that's why we need to uh, request a waiver from the Maryland State Board of Education. Um, a lot of what we learned is um, our conversations with our union partners, um, as well as looking at the calendar, is aligned with the work that we do for our general calendar. So we have been coordinate, coordinating that work with Dr. Zuckerman and Mr. Collette as well, because um, there will be some overlap in terms of the holidays, maybe the spring break. Um, we may have to do, may do be able to do something different with the emergency closures, but there's a lot of other alignment with the general calendar, so we're, we're collaborating on that front as well. I know, Andy, if you want to add anything to that. I mean, I would just add that, it, as Ms. Collins said, I mean, just overall the, 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 the tracks are generally the same. Um, there's no, the, the holiday schedule, spring break schedule, everything will, will really look the same in, in that regard. What we're really asking here for is um, to go to really, as, as she said, to go to start earlier. Um, and then because we have more days, there may be some adjustments that we can make in consultation with our employee associations to things like grading planning, but the overall frame of spring break, of holidays, that that is all aligned. That's our that's our plan. So in terms of next steps, again, we will submit the waiver, but we will continue to meet to talk about the programmatic pieces. We've actually been meeting monthly. We have a meeting, a summer, a last summer meeting coming up as well. Um, continue to engage staff in the community. We're actually working with um, the Department of Communications on um, a communication plan similar to what's done with the general calendar. Again, trying to make sure that we are keeping our community informed, but also getting input as well, because we want this to be homegrown. Again, we don't want this to be that we're going to tell the schools what this has to look like. We really want it to grow organically. Also looking at um, ways to be innovative. So we've been reaching out to other school districts who have various models around an extended school year and trying to make sure that we can bring something very innovative um, to the school as well. Um, and we look forward to this scaling up. We need the, the funding to be able to do that, but um, we don't want this to be a pilot. We want to be able to sustain this. And so that's very important. Some of the questions that we've been asked is, this is a pilot. I keep saying, it's not a pilot because this is about students and student learning, right? And so we're going to make this great. Um, on our team, we have someone from the Office of Shared Accountability as well, because we really want to make sure we identify what are the metrics that we're going to use to evaluate um, that there's a return on the investment as well of the innovative school calendar. Okay. okay, thank you. Uh, Ms. O'Neill, you want to lead off? Well, yeah, I think this is very exciting. Um, you know, and I, the devil is in the details working through. I mean, it's the right thing for kids, but, you know, flashing through my mind were, you know, okay, from the adult point of view, you know, leadership week, you know, school improvement planning occurs, you know, right now, traditionally in the summer, and then, how do you divide up these three days? Is there an additional marking period, or is this 
lumped onto the first marking period, you know, things like that. And then thinking about Roscoe Mix, it is a paired school with Crest Haven. So, you know, having common breaks, I would think from a family perspective would be a good idea, you know, because, you know, what the Crest Haven kids off at different times from Roscoe Nick. So, um, you know, and, and, you know, I think many of the issues are more, you know, sort of the adults in the building, mm -hmm. the details about as uh, professionals, you know, ha you know, having time to get that professional learning and, um, but you know, I don't. I, none of these are insurmountable odds. They're they're just the nitty gritty details that do have to be worked out. Mm -hmm. So, um, as far as I'm concerned, you know, let's go forward and ask the state board and and try. Mm -hmm. Dr. Daka. Okay, my question is pretty similar to what uh, Ms. O'Neill was talking about. You're going to have quarters of 52 days. So that means it's different from the quarters that the rest of the school would have. How's that going to work out for parents? You know? So that is something that we're going to have to work out. The quarters will be around probably on 52 to 54 days. Um, so as we look at once the general school year calendar is is um, approved, that's why we're working side by side to see what are some options within the innovative calendar so there is least impactful for families. That's the nitty gritty logistic that we still need to work out. Yeah. Ms. Ortman Faust. I really appreciate this development um, that, that the, where you've gotten to on this and I know that a, at least a couple of us have been bringing this up for the last few years. The research shows that summer slide is a real thing. Uh, I saw a wonderful video at one of our conferences that I've shared online, and I don't know if my colleagues have seen it, that's a great illustration for what happens over the summer um, with summer learning loss and why we were so opposed to uh, the starting after Labor Day, Labor Day mandate, one of the many reasons we were opposed to that. Um, so, but a, a number of folks have said, well, why not year-round school? That's probably the most frequent question I've gotten, instead of this extended learning um, and do you want to explain why that this is the this is the better choice for our kids yes yeah, so this is a it's a better choice for our students um, and and trying to to dr. doctor your point and trying to align it with the existing calendar and try to avoid as least of an impact for families this is a much easier way to go also we we considered if we needed to scale this up down the road to other schools, this is an easier model to scale up. Um, with the year-round model, oftentimes the, um, the weeks and the breaks are different. Also, the schools have what are called intercessions, and so it's not required. And so attendance isn't as well during the intercessions because students don't have to attend. So therefore, it's not doing what it, you would hope that it would do. And then um, the teachers may also not be teaching during the intercession, so the, the students may be experiencing different teachers. So this provides another level of consistency, extending it this way as, as well. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Dr. Smith. And I was just going to point out, um, uh, one of the, f I think, frustrations that I feel all the time, and I think it's pretty obvious to most people, regardless of what their preference is about summer and what their family's experience is in the summer, but one of the, we set a school calendar right now that is completely irrelevant to 95% of the people in this country. 95%. Fewer than, than about 5% of the people are involved in agriculture. In 1900, 95% of the people were involved in agriculture. And yet we're completely stuck in that pattern. And so you have for many, many students the summer learning loss. Not all, a lot of students have very enriched summers because they travel with their family, they go to see grandparents, they're at the Smithsonian, they're all over the place. But for many, many students, more than those others, there is real loss in learning, especially for young readers and for mathematicians, really until you get up into upper level algebra because you lose ground in mathematics. The other part of this that I think we have to keep our eye on and we have to keep pushing back on people who want to argue, 
for decades, for centuries in this country, learning has been the variable and time has been the constant. You get 180 days. If you don't learn to read in 180 days, we'll move you to the next grade and we'll try again. Why don't we make learning the constant, or the learning the, the constant and time the variable? Not every school in Montgomery County needs an extended year program, but a lot of them do. A great number of them, when you have a, a lot of students need extended year, but not every school needs to be extended year. So let's be smart and think, uh, you're right, Dan, we have to take this to scale for many, many schools in this county, not all. And then where we don't take it to scale, we're going to have programs like EOL, Bell, other things that we do, or those children have the option of going to a neighboring school that has this. But we've got to push back against an agrarian, agriculturally centered calendar and the idea that 180 days is enough. It's not for many, many children. They need more time to build that schema and that understanding, not because there's anything wrong with the children. They've simply had few, less access and fewer opportunities. That's the name of the game. And we've got to push back loud and strong on those issues when people say, well, why not this, why not that? 180 days is still 180 days. 210 days is 210 days of learning opportunity and access. Thanks, Dr. Smith. Ms. Taticonda. I mean, those words were golden. I don't think I have to share anything more mm -hmm. than that. Um, this is definitely a push in the right direction. I mean, thank you, Dr. Smith, for pushing us in this direction. And thank you to everyone who has put in so much work and effort into developing this. I mean, this is really gonna, I'm really excited to see the positive impact this makes on student academic achievement at these schools. So thank you. Thank you. Ms. Dixon? So I just want to uh, thank Dr. Johnson and Dr. Collins for, for their presentations. Um, so one of the things that struck me in terms of the, the two schools and the um, teaching staffs is that, um, you know, probably not everyone in those schools will want to you know, be a part of the 210 days. So I, I'm hoping that, you know, when we do the um, uh, job fairs or, you know, how we do it uh, in the spring, maybe what we could do is um, do something a little earlier uh, in terms of those teachers who want to transfer and those who want to transfer in uh, as well uh, to get that set, um, you know, maybe somewhere around February uh, for that first and then you know maybe all the other uh, transfers so um, do we have any um, numbers in terms of what it costs to implement this program or is that something that I can get from Nikki at another time uh, we can actually provide it we will actually need to provide it to the board because it'll be part of the consideration for the FY 20 budget so right. we will um, give you right now our estimation, but through the budget process, we'll provide you a detailed breakout. Okay, okay. So you're going to give the estimate now or, or, later. or later? I'll provide it later. Um, okay. I have to double check my numbers. It's somewhere around, well, let me not say. Let me, let me okay. provide it yeah. later. I'm just curious because, you know, as Dr. Smith was saying, that, you know, more students need, obviously, 210 days. And, and I don't want to be greedy about this, but, you know, it would be wonderful if all, you know, 25 Title I schools could have, uh, you know, 210 days. I mean, that yes. might be something down the line. Uh, and I wonder what that would cost and, you know, whether we'd be willing, you know, as a community, Montgomery County, to invest in it. I think, you know, probably people would. It can't be too far down the line, yeah. first of all. Yeah. And let's just do some theoretical math here. So let's say it's a million dollars a school. It won't be because mm -hmm. different schools are different sizes. Right. And so we'll have to look at it. But it's not going to be profoundly more than that. Yeah. But yeah. let's say it's a million dollars a school. 25 Title I schools, that's $25 million. Yeah. That's 1% of the Montgomery County Public, it's actually slightly less yeah. than 1% of the Montgomery County Public Schools budget. But it will require that we think differently how right. to use the money that we're allocated because we simply can't do everything for everyone. So how do we keep the high level of performance we've had for so many kids and change it for the ones that haven't had those opportunities and that access? And I just wanna really draw a distinction between access and opportunity. Right. Access is getting in, access is having 30 more days. Opportunity is providing all the supports and structures so students are successful. Right. 
when we say opportunity and access, we're talking about two different things. Right. And, and we need to all keep that in mind. So access gives them access to 30 more days of learning. Opportunity means we've made sure that's successful learning opportunity. Right. And so, right. Great. And I'm hoping also that during these, uh, you know, additional days that the students will have an opportunity to go places a couple of times oh, because absolutely. I really feel very, very strongly that, um, you know, a lot of learning takes place on field trips and uh, yes. things like that. And, um, and I'd certainly, uh, you know, much rather have that. Um, so good. Thank you guys. This is, this is great. It's exciting and uh, look forward to voting for it. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Evans. Sure. Mine is real brief. Um, thank you for the presentation. Um, definitely um, a great opportunity for us to have innovative programming for some of our students. Just a quick question just for our viewers. People may think, oh, we're going to look to get this waiver. We'll get it in two days. Can you get everybody an idea of how long it could take? Or do we know that? So we're hoping to submit the waiver application towards the middle or end of August. And then what the application says is the Maryland State Board of Education reviews applications on a rolling basis. So hopefully it would be at their next meeting. And then we will, of course, we'll do check-ins if we don't hear, but we want to hear as soon as possible. So selfishly, we want to hear like the end of September, right? Um, but our goal is as soon as possible because to your point, Ms. Dixon, we've already talked with um, Dana Edwards and her team in the Office of Human Resource and Development about moving up the staffing calendar actually around January, February for these two schools having a separate fair. So a lot of the programmatic pieces that we want to do are predicated on us getting this waiver. So, but it is on a rolling basis that they review the applications. Thank you. Additional questions? Ms. O'Neill, Dr. Doc? I don't know, I have a few ideas. I don't think you're gonna like it. Drop the consortia. Allow students to access programs in other schools and we'll go to the policy committee with that. Use those funds to increase the number of year-round schools. Just thought I'd mention that. Ms. Hortman Faust. I always like your ideas. <laughs> um, so my, you mentioned the communications plan. So knock on wood that the innovative calendar is approved and you move forward with that. You'll be reaching out into the neighborhoods and the communities so that they'll all know what's happening in their, um, in their home school. Absolutely. So what we like to do um, as a follow up from this meeting, we'll have um, communication that will go out to the staff as well as the families before the, the pre-service week and the start of the school year. Um, and then, as I said, we're meeting with uh, Mr. Turner to come up with a specific communication can. I mean, the nice thing is that the principals have a great relationship with the staff and the community. But again, it may not be reaching out. Um, through our initial meetings, our parents have some uh, very innovative ideas of their own that are very standards and curriculum based. And while we've talked about um, field trips, typically with programs, it may just happen at one point in time in the summer. But with innovation, you have a chance to do it throughout the school year, right? So how do we look at innovation and field trips differently than we have in the past. Our staff have talked about how do we bring in families more often since they have more time, you know? How do we look at family events differently because of the amount of time? How do we look at how we do parent conferences? Maybe we wanna do more than one. So there's a lot more opportunity to do that. But we are actually coming up with a specific written communication plan and we'll present it to families and we'll keep meeting to make sure that um, as much as possible they're not out of the loop and rely on the principals that know the cultures of their schools to make sure that um, we're adding value and infiltrating sort of on the existing cultures that they have around communication because the families do feel comfortable doing that. And so you're touching base with the greater school community, not just the people who are Absolutely. involved in decision making. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Ms. Tadakonda? Ms. Dixon? No, I just wanted to say thank you to Andrew Klein uh, for being here and also for, you know, taking on a review of our plan. We look forward to seeing you in September. Ms. Evans, anything additional? Just had a, a, a couple follow-ups because it it appears that we are all pretty much on the same page uh, on the philosophy of this uh, innovative calendar with uh, our Cole and Roscoe Nix. Uh, it, it's when we get into some of the practical aspects. And I, I had a calendar question. You know, even if our Cola and Roscoe Nix were not in the equation, this coming calendar is, is probably going to be a bit challenging. Are we hoping 
to do both of them in tandem, or or how how's that play out? The answer is yes. We are hoping to do them in tandem. Uh, the timing around the state board approval of the waivers is, is very critical. But the idea here is for these two calendars to come to you in tandem. And uh, this was discussed at the policy management committee in tandem um, at the at the most recent meeting as well. And do we have any idea, either formally or informally, of how long a process it is for the state to to give us an answer? Because it it does seem like they 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 hold the cards. So we know that um, from other jurisdictions that right. have done this work. Um, and we spoke to them that they do um, start viewing it on a rolling basis and provide feedback. So our goal was to come to the entire board in early August so that hopefully um, within um, a month or two we would hear back and be in a continuation of an aligned uh, process to our process for calendar adoptions. Dr. Smith. Let's make sure that we look at the state board calendar and at least one week before the August meeting that we've submitted our waiver request. And that me, I think that will virtually guarantee us that we'll have an answer no later than after the September meeting. So let's make sure that at least one week before their meeting that we've submitted it, we might get caught up in August approvals, but certainly then we would be caught into a September approval, which would then, because it, it's absolutely essential we do these calendars in tandem that we adopt a calendar and then an adjusted calendar for these two schools. And if and if the board has to take action beyond, I, I guess, a, a preliminary, we're on board this evening, you know, we don't meet again until August 30th. So I, I, I don't know how that plays out. So this board tonight, uh, the, our request is to authorize a, a waiver request, which is at a, a slightly more general level it's what you see in the green okay. sheet. Um, that waiver request that authorizes us to make a request to the state board, ideally we would have a response from the state board by the end of September. The policy management committee meeting is in September where we bring the uh, first draft of the calendar to policy management committee. Um, ideally we'd have approval from the state board before that. If we don't, we can still bring a draft from the policy management committee on the innovative calendar to look at. And then the next step would bring to be to bring both of those calendars to the full board in October uh, for review. Um, and at that point, depending on how we've things have played out over the last couple of years, um, we ideally would have approval um, in between October and November from you on the calendar, depending okay. on feedback that you have and the sequencing of the board meetings. So, with some of it in anticipation of board state board that is action, we're we're still doing some things simultaneously. That's right. Okay. Uh, with that in mind, then, if we could have a motion. I move the waiver request for the innovative school calendar. Second. We have a motion and a second. All in favor? And that is unanimous. Uh, Dr. Collins, Dr. Johnson, thank you both.